she's doing okay, I guess, but we can expect her back next week. And uh, improvisation is important to us, and the improvisation means that I will be your pastor for the next hour. <laughs> it is Pentecost. That is the day when we celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit amongst us and within us. That's important. Not just amongst us, but within us. We carry God in our beings. There are many manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Manifestations is a big fancy word, meaning ways that the Holy Spirit shows itself. Uh, a lot of names that we have. When you look through the Bible, you find that the Holy Spirit is called a fire because one of its manifestations is to inspire us when we need a fire lit underneath us. The Holy Spirit's also called the wind because it blows through and refreshes us when we are in need of having our spirits refreshed. The Holy Spirit is likened to a dove, because a dove is a symbol of peace, and when there is turbulence and turmoil in our lives, the Holy Spirit is there to give us peace. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter, because when we are sad, lonely, we need help from somewhere within and without. It is the comfort of the Spirit that is there. And finally, for today, the Holy Spirit is called the Encourager. Because when we are in despair, when we are disillusioned, the Holy Spirit comes to bring us hope. That is what I saw today in the Scriptures. That is what I would like to convey to you. The Spirit of hope amongst us and within us for this Pentecost Sunday. Announcements. Uh, I see that we're starting in on our summer schedule. Uh, the last of the uh, uh, Linus meetings is this week. Uh, there's also a... Uh, did you say anything about the church council meeting Tuesday night? Just that it will be Church Council meeting Tuesday night. Looks like we're beginning our summer schedule. Uh, are there announcements that uh, someone would like to make mention for us this morning? Um, Peggy sent me an email this morning to share with you. So, I will do that. Good morning, friends. I'm home recuperating from the hospital stay. I wanted to let you know that I had sepsis that started in the gut and I'm still on strong antibiotics. I caught a germ somewhere, impossible to tell where, but because my immune system was basically destroyed last year, any germ can be dangerous. Had Linda not been persistent and gotten Donna involved, the hospital said I probably would have slipped away. I can't thank them enough. Having said all that, I also want you to know I'm okay and moving forward toward being as good as new. So here's the plan dictated by the hospital. No heavy activity for a few weeks. Sleep more. Finish the medication, drink lots of fluids, check in with my doctor. Follow the prescribed diet. I need folks who can volunteer to run errands, take things to church, and other things as needed so I can rest up. That might be the important one that I'm reading here. Use hand sanitizer, no handshaking, no hugs, and then she wrote, bummer. No participating in large groups so she won't be attending the annual conference this year. I have to be released by the doctor to return to work. It could be as early as next Sunday. I will know midweek. No visits to hospitals or nursing homes if the folks I'm visiting are sick rather than injured or some other reason. Thank you. Prayers meeting. Other announcements this morning? Pat. Yes, sir. Will lead us in praise music. Starting with 393. 
Good morning. Consuming our selfishness, 
our hatred, and our indifference, filling our lives with new life and the light of God. Come, Come Holy Spirit. Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, our lives bear fruit. Like the beacon of a lighthouse, may the fruit of the Spirit shine in our lives. Come, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never leaves us where we are. We are sent by the Spirit out into the world to be the salt of the earth, to show God's love to all people, to bring God's Spirit of joy to the world. Come, Holy Spirit. Gracious God, pour your Spirit into our hearts so we worship today with all our hearts and carry your joy from this place into all the world. To you we give our honor and praise. invitation to the Holy Spirit. O oh God, the Holy Spirit, come to us and among us. Come as the wind and cleanse us. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the dew and refresh. Convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to our great good and to thy greater glory. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Our opening hymn in the United Methodist Temple was number 347, Spirit Song. Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, 
and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This ends the reading. The epistle reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit? Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The saints read. Before we get to the Gospel reading, and it is yet another rather lengthy reading, but the, uh, the readings from Pentecost are fairly long, uh, it would help us to know the setting. John puts this in a rather lengthy discourse between Jesus and his disciples, in which Jesus does almost all of the talking, and the disciples are sitting there listening, and a bit perplexed. Uh, they don't really understand all that Jesus is trying to tell them, in fact, very little. But uh, Jesus figures that eventually it will begin to make sense to them. And so he's frightened, perplexed, uh, young men who have been following Jesus for several years now hear these words from their master. And you may stand. You are able. From John chapters 15 and 16. When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Now, I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin 
and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin. Because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when the Spirit of Truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own, He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. <coughs> did you get all that? <laughs> well, neither did the disciples, because as we look on uh, just briefly to the, to the next few ver verses, it says, what are the disciples says, what does he mean by all that he is saying? And then later, we don't understand what he is saying. So you're in good company. <laughs> And so am I. May God bless the reading of his word as it sets into our hearts.
thank you so much. That is uh, chorus, I guess we call it. Wonderful. See, that's what that's what happens when the spirit comes. It it, it fills us with some sort of spirit, like the joy and the uplifting that, that we felt during that musical number. It's now time for us to uh, bring our needs to God in prayer. Our joys and concerns, of course, as we've already spoken of uh, Pastor Peggy and our concern for our joy for her release from the hospital and our concern for her continued recovery. And that is on our minds. Uh, other things that you would like to have in our minds as we go to prayer today. It seems I never get done talking on here. Uh, I had a week of reprieve from Sandy after her funeral. And Wednesday afternoon, I get a phone call from a super, super good friend of ours that we have known forever, that he has stage three lung cancer. And they were doing a brain scan, and possibly stage four. And he had no idea. Um, so, please pray for him. His name is O.J. Carter, and this is going to take me out of here, too, I think. It's just, I need your help, and today sounds like it's the right day to be here. Thank you. So, I have a couple joys. First is Riley's home. Um, She's going to be doing an internship at a civil engineering firm right here in Westminster this summer, full time. Um, and the rain let up just in time for Caroline to get some pictures done before her boyfriend's senior prom. And the last thing I wanted to ask for is just to keep me in your thoughts. I've been out of work for six weeks now, had a car accident. Um, so I'm just, you know, I, don't, I need to know my limitations, I guess would be the right thing. But it, so, patience is not something I do or have, and I don't have this bit. So, um, but a back concussion, back and neck injuries. So, and I'll be out of work for at least another three weeks. So. Difficult time. Good morning. Um, I continue prayers for uh, my nephew's fiance's father, John Miller, up in Ohio, who um, has, <coughs> I can't remember, but he had a um, tumor on his spine, and it's not looking good for him, but he missed her graduation with her master's degree, which really disappointed him, but um, they're getting married June 30th, and prayers that he'll be able to walk her down the aisle. I know there are many joys and concerns that you have in your heart that you have chosen to keep there. Let's now spend a few moments bringing those things most dear to us to God in prayer. Lord, on this Pentecost Sunday, we put our joys and our concerns before you, knowing that you do care, that you are with us in our struggles, that you bless us in our joys. Father, we, uh, we ask for you to give us the insight to see where, where we can make a difference, perhaps make life easier and ease the pain for those that we know who are in the greatest need. We see again the tragedies of a school shooting and, and 
we don't understand how this all shakes out, Lord. We ask you to help us to do what we can when we feel so helpless in the face of tragedy. Fill us with your spirit today. Bless us with whatever it is we most need to go on and face tomorrow. We ask this in the name of him who taught us the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For this is kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Now, <coughs> ask the ushers to come forward as we bring our gifts to God.
grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, from Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and, especially on this Pentecost Day, from the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Purveyor of Hope. Uh, I need to change the sermon title. That was Peggy's sermon that was in the bulletin, and, and, and I want to give you a, a different title. You can write it in if you like, but that's not essential. Uh, and I take it as a corollary to uh, the uh, entryway to hell in Dante's Inferno. You know what it said to the entryway of hell in Dante's Inferno? Any of you remember your... Oh, yes. <laughs> Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. And the sermon of the day is, hang on to hope, all ye who ent have entered here. Hang on <laughs> to hope. We have lengthy texts today, and not easy ones, by the way. Uh, they, they, they need to be spent some time with and pondered over, but... But what it basically says, and by the way, we read them in the wrong order. Because we always read the gospel last. But the gospel text, the John text, needed to be read before the Exodus, because they, they go one right after the other. And, and what we have is Jesus saying to his disciples, I'm going away. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to die. And, and, and they're heartbroken. They're torn. But he says, don't be. Don't be. This is a good thing because while I'm here, uh, you rely on me to uh, make God known to you. But when I go away, the Holy Spirit is going to come and it's not going to be outside you. It's going to be within you. The Holy Spirit will fill you and be part of you. And that's better. That's better yet to have God dwelling as part of your very being. They were frightened. They were confused. They were disillusioned. Their hope was Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going to be killed. Where does their hope go then? And then comes Pentecost, that Acts reading, that uh, day when the Spirit came in a powerful, mighty way that we really can't understand. We can only hear how Luke describes it in Acts. And they're energetic, they're empowered, they are hopeful because now God is within them in the person of the Spirit. They now can do things that they could not before. I remember when I was in college, I, I ran across a little saying by Edward Everett Hale. That's, that's half a century ago and then some. <laughs> I still remember it. It became a part of what I incorporated into my lifestyle, or attempted to do so. Edward Everett Hale was, uh, he, he was a, a thinker, a deep thinker. He was a minister, clergyman. And uh, he was uh, <coughs> named as a chaplain to the United States Senate. That's a while back. It was 1903. Probably Bob's the only one that remembers that day. <laughs> He's not a recent thinker. He died over a century ago. But he said this that lives on and, 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 and I so identify with it. He said, I am only one. But I am one. I can't do everything. But I can do something. And I will not let what I cannot do interfere with what I can. That's what the spirit of hope does. 
Yeah, but it would be easy to despair because our friends are sick. But there's evil and, and, and dying around us. But we don't because there is something we can do through that spirit that somehow we don't understand lives within us. <clears throat> One of my favorite hope stories goes back to when my son Chad was six years old, maybe seven. <coughs> and his mom used to play games with him. Now poor Chad, his mother was a teacher, so she always wanted to play educational games. <laughs> Those of you who don't have teachers for mothers are rather more fortunate than he was. So she brought out the memory game. And Chad brought out Candyland. <laughs> and Bonnie looks at him and she says, Well, don't, wouldn't you rather play memory? Said, no, I'd like to play Candyland. Said, but there's not much thinking in Candyland. And he says, But there's a lot of hoping in Candyland. <laughs> <laughs> And hoping is more important than thinking. Although thinking is sometimes important too. But hope is what motivates us to go on when it would be so easy to give up. Next weekend, uh, a movie is coming out. Maybe some of you have heard about it uh, called Solo. It's part of the Star Wars series. I don't know, it's the eighth or the ninth Star Wars series. And the first one, believe it or not, uh, 41 years ago when uh, Star Wars first came out, the very first one. Um, well, what's the point? Every Star Wars movie is the same movie. It's the same theme. You have, on one hand, the evil that is all-powerful, that is in control, is in charge, and threatens to snuff out the good. And then on the other, you have the good that is so insignificant that it looks totally hopeless. There's that word. The, the good uh, that can't possibly prevail against this overwhelming evil. But they hang on. And lo and behold, who finally ultimately wins? Well, Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Triumph of good in a hopeless situation over evil. We, we love that theme. And, you know, it's not just Star Wars. You, you look at the other great books and movies of our generation, you know, Lord of the Rings. The little hobbit doesn't have a chance against that horrible evil power that's in control. The Narnia tales that C.S. Lewis wrote. The Hunger Games. You probably have seen that if you're young enough. Uh, all the, the powerful evil that will overwhelm the good. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Because in our fictitious world, the little good that there is with hope overcomes and overwhelms. Does that equate with the real world? Well, maybe not. Or maybe sometimes so. You know, the same theme is pervasive in the Bible. It's not just in our world with the, with the writers of today. It's the same thing in the Bible. Again and again and again, you have the powerful evil forces, or those depicted as evil, that have enslaved and threatened to overwhelm the good, and the good hangs on. There's, there's Egypt holding the nation of Israel in slavery with, with a, a power that will not, never let them go. And then, and then, Along comes the hero Moses to confront Pharaoh, and despite all odds, prevails. We have again the, the Philistines that are wreaking havoc on the Israelite nation, their giant Goliath, 
impossible odds. And then there comes a hero, David, to fight against those impossible odds with nothing but hope. And he prevails. We have Elijah on Mount Carmel against all the prophets of Baal, impossible odds. Hope is what he has and prevails. And what about the Persian Empire that had subjugated the Jews and, and they were hopeless they were a situation? And here comes Esther along to confront Xerxes and impossible odds but with hope prevails. Again and again and again. So we get up to the New Testament now. I could give you more examples but you get the picture. Now we have the Roman Empire that has the, the Israel, uh, the nation of Israel under its thumb, demanding taxes, uh, interfering with their religion and their way of life, uh, with all the power and the legions in the world against this poor little nation of Israel. And one person stands up with hope. It is indeed, of course, Jesus. Now, his victory may not look much like victory to the Romans, but we have the benefit of history to look back and see it differently. Hope is such an important factor. We, we, cannot, we cannot give up on it. And that spirit that Jesus sent now dwells in us to make us the ones who must stand up against all odds for what is right and good. Just one more example with a quote. Again, a person that uh, had an impossible task ahead of him. His name is Viktor Frankl. Victor Fanko was an Austrian doctor, uh, and in the 40s, when Austria was overwhelmed by Nazi Germany, he, being a Jewish doctor, was uh, sent off to prison camps. He spent 1942 to 1945 in those prison camps, and there he saw people giving up, despairing, Dying. He said, some people survived and some people didn't. He said, the one thing that seemed to be the key to survival was hope. Those who held on to hope somehow muddled through even this horrible situation. And Viktor Frankl later wrote some books. One of them is about search for meaning. And in it, he says this. If just one person knows what you are feeling and cares, you can survive virtually any situation. If just one person knows what you are going through and cares, you can survive almost any situation. Now, I would put it to you that you need to be that person who for others can understand and care. You have to be nothing more than a listener and a carer. And the spirit of hope that dwells within you will make that possible. You see, no, I am only one. But you are one. I can't do everything. But you can do something. So don't let what you cannot do stop you from doing what you can through the spirit of hope that in this Pentecost season we are reminded dwells in us. Let's pray. Lord God, how grateful we are 
that you have planted the seed of hope in our lives and, and bodies because of your spirit. Now as we go forth, somehow help us to convey that to the hurting world that we run into as your emissaries in Jesus' name. We have a special <coughs> Let's stand and say not our closing hymn. Number 333 in the Methodist hymnal. We'll sing when the Spirit says sing. Let us depart in hope to serve our risen Lord.